my Facebook the other day on my way in. And here was an entry. As a Christian leader, have you ever really accomplished something for this world? <laughs> Actually, he started off by saying, I'm sure you're a really nice guy and you talk really well, but do you ever do anything important? Or has it been just a lot of talk? Why don't you sort of just get a job? In a nutshell, I think you're a freeloader living off other people's money. This is on my Facebook. So the person comes into my living room to insult me, you know, essentially. So here is the, at least a portion of my response. Um, if you think regular work is taxing, try standing in front of ideologically hostile audiences, uh, live and on TV, uh, being fired at left and right, and then decide if it's freeloader living. <laughs> I'm willing to take a thoughtful stand publicly and then let the other objectors give me their best substantive shot if they have one. <laughs> now, uh, what I do for a living, uh, I run an organization called Stand to Reason, STR is the acronym, str.org is our website, so if you'd like to visit that, you're welcome to. We have thousands of pages of information. I think it's a good example of a, a website that functions well to serve people's needs. I am not largely on the technical side, though. As a Christian communicator, I'm, I'm kind of like a classical media, old media um, in interaction. We have IT people who do all of what many of you do so well. Um, I'm an old timer, and so I just talk. I don't even use PowerPoint. You know, I'm just an old time communicator, but I've been on radio for 25 years. And even though uh, I don't spend all of my time in the crossfire, so to speak, uh, there is a significant number of things that I've done. And weekly, I have a three hour radio show, which is call in radio. So people can call in to me and ask me questions or challenge my ideas, and we have interactive conversation there. Um, and then I have been invited in a number of forums to either do debates publicly at university environments, uh, to do debates on TV, uh, to do debates on radio, uh, to be guest on other video productions where I'm kind of like a hired gun and they come in and they interview me and then they uh, put a nice backdrop behind me in the production stage and uh, actually make me look better than I, I really am, but then dovetail it in with with other uh, other speakers that have made a contribution. So I, I, I have a lot of um, background communication experience um, with media. And so what I want to bring to you today is some insights from my experience that might be helpful to you. Now, I, many of you are on the technical side, some of you are actually on our presence, um, but I think there may be ways that you can take some of the things that I have offer you uh, about my own insights on working with media over 25 years now. I first started doing regular radio in the mid 80s as a guest uh, on another show where it was a Roman Catholic priest, a Protestant minister, that would be me, a Jewish rabbi, and a Jewish talk show host, who by the way was Dennis Prager, who has come to have national uh, prominence as a as a, a conservative political and religious speaker, a Jewish man, but um, very friendly to evangelical Christians, so some of you might recognize him. But the, I started out as a guest on his show. I did his show 25 times over a number of years. In any event, that's my, that's my background, and I, I want to tell you a little bit how I personally use social media. Um, that is, as a um, as a public figure, how I use it. My my team uses it much more extensively than I do, and we have we have. Um, Facebook and Twitter and Google and Pinterest and Instagram and YouTube and blogs and video. We've got all that going, but most of that I don't mess with because it's too complicated for me. But I'll tell you what I personally do. I want to talk about what I do on my own show, what my goal is as a talk show host, and then what I do uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm on somebody else's show or in somebody else's venue. And oftentimes that's a friendly environment where I'm being interviewed by someone who agrees with me, but many times it's in a crossfire, or an unfriendly, uh, an ideologically hostile environment, though that doesn't mean that the people are necessarily mean. 
but, uh, but I have to defend my point of view in that environment. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll just open it up for questions, and I'll do my best to uh, answer questions. I apologize. I think I talk a little bit fast. And uh, I am always amazed when I come to a venue like this, the cosmopolitan environment, and how well everybody speaks English. You speak English better than most Americans, frankly. Um, but I, I, I realize also that maybe I speak a little too fast, so I'll try to pace myself a bit. Um, l l let me make some general comments about social media, how I use it. Uh, personally, I think social media is a massive nuisance. It does a lot of good, and people use it to great effect. But for me as an individual, for me to have to keep up with, I do Facebook and Twitter. That's it. And I have very particular reasons for doing that. And if I was not a professional in a business where I, where I was trying to make an impact for the kingdom, I wouldn't bother with it. Um, what I want to do with per social media, and I, like I said, our organization has used it very effectively. And you can check out Stand to Reason in these different uh, social media environments and see what they're doing. But um, I, th I think that, and I also have a staffer that even helps out with my Facebook when people ask questions real quickly, they'll go in and see it. That's something they can answer and they post it so I don't have to worry too much. But um, here's what I don't do with social media. I do not use social media to visit or to fraternize with people, you know, even Facebook. Now, for, for some people, regular people on the street, they take Facebook and they connect with their friends and this is just a way to have a little community. You can't be friends though with 6,000 people. I got 6,500 people that kind of thumbs up on my own a professional Facebook. And so I don't use it for that purpose, which means I don't get back there usually and carry on interactive conversations. I have too much to do. If I can post once a day on my Facebook just to say something to keep people updated with me, then, then I think I'm doing pretty well. And other people will weigh in, and I like to see what they have to say, but I usually do not interact. So I don't use it for uh, fraternizing, and I personally don't use it to argue. Um, for one, I, don't, I look at Facebook like my living room. People can come into my home and visit with me, and this is the big advantage for me as a public person. The liability of being a public person in a, in a work like this is people um, don't think of you as a real human being. Um, they think of you in a way that probably we shouldn't be thinking of our leaders. We put them in a, uh, a, the wrong place. And so what I want people to do is to be able to come into my living room and visit with me a little bit on my Facebook. That's what it's for. It's not for hammering out issues of theology. And when people weigh in with then an argument starts. I get rid of all of that off my Facebook. I, and I tell people, I don't want to, I, you can't come into my living room and beat up on my guests. That's not what this is about. I want them to meet my children. I have a nine-year-old daughter and a six-year-old daughter. And in two weeks, I turn 64, so uh, I need prayer. Uh, <laughs> but um, people like to see my life. I have a workshop where I do woodworking and we do video blogs actually in the woodworking shop. And it just helps people to see that I'm a real person. So the things that I post to my Facebook are the kinds of things that are just inviting people into my life, helping to see about my family, my kids, and when I go fishing and you know what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and nothing special. But I find that this is very helpful because it, it helps me to be a three-dimensional human being to people who would have a temptation because of the media role and other things to maybe think of me in a, in, a, in a wrong kind of way, to think of me more like a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, um, a celebrity of some sort, which I don't, I think that's not healthy. And so I want them to see, I'm just, ordering. that's how I use my Facebook. When it comes to Twitter, all I want to do is make an impact with 140 words. I want to say something meaningful. Uh, I don't retweet a bunch of other people's stuff because I'm not reading other people's stuff. I'm not reading other people's tweets. I don't have the time for that. I got little kids, I got a ministry, I just don't have time to be back and forth. Now other people can do it all, I can't. I'm slowing down, so I don't worry about that. What I wanna do is get out 140 letters or less and say something memorable or useful, so much so that people retweet it. 
And if people are not retweeting it, in my view, I'm not doing my job. And so, you know, I had recently a comment about uh, kamikaze witnessing. You know, kamikaze are the suicide pilots that would crash in the war. In the war. Some people witness like that. Fly recklessly, directly at your target. There's a big explosion and everybody dies. <laughs> this is not a good way to witness, right? Um, or um, a person with an unshakable faith in a false belief has an unshakable fantasy. So I'm trying to I'm trying to find a little quip or proverb that I might invent something that's memorable but it's useful. People say, "Hey, that helps me. Good. I'm going to pass that on." And so when I pass they pass it on, this leverages my impact. I have a big, greater impact because I can reach all those people that the people who are following me on Twitter can reach. And it exposes them also to stand to reason. So they might come to our website or some of our other social media that the rest of our team does such a good job of keeping alive. That's all I want to do with social media. And to me, it's a chore. I have to have it on my to-do list, Facebook, Twitter, to make sure I get it done every day. And I don't do it every day. So you folks are probably much more proficient in the use of those kinds of social media tools than, than I have been. I just see them as tools and uh, not as recreation. And I, I force myself to use them. I try to use them as effectively as possible. Then I move on to the things that I really think I'm better equipped at doing. Um, let's talk about my own show. I've been doing radio for 25 years now. Uh, I didn't plan to get into radio. It was kind of an accident. Um, I don't particularly like radio. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of concentration. Um, I do my live show now on uh, Tuesday nights for three hours. And uh, it's broadcast in 125 stations around the country uh, in, in the States. But the biggest impact is podcast. And so that's why I can meet people here in Europe who are familiar with the show because they listen to the podcast. And uh, um, I'm really gratified to hear that. The... Um, um, the way I look at my own show, I have three goals for my show. I want to give information. I want to model behavior, model a certain type of interaction, a certain way of doing thoughtful Christianity. Um, and I want to, in a certain sense, kind of mentor people at a distance. So I think of myself a little bit in a pastoral role here. Um, the way I explain to people when I train them to interact, I say, you know, here's some ideas about how to engage, like what I'm doing this week. But if you listen to the podcast, it's only three hours a week. That's just one commute in Los Angeles. <laughs> it's doable. And, uh, and I think this is the best way you're going to see this stuff that I'm teaching you in action. It's almost like you can listen over my shoulder while I'm engaging atheists or critics of some sense, or people who are Christians who disagree with me on a, on a theological issue or something, or people who have questions because they're engaging atheists and other skeptics, and they come to me and say, how can I deal with this? And what I want to communicate is not just a piece of information. Um, I want to help them to see a tactical approach to engaging other people. I've written a book on tactics. It's called Tactics. A game plan for discussing your Christian conviction. There's about 20 of them downstairs in the bookstore. But there's a very particular way that I go about engaging people that I found very effective. And people who have used the technique have found it very effective as well. Are you familiar with this? Is that where you're nodding? Yeah, it was good. It's nice to see that. Um, so we have a, someone that's a personal experience with that. But see, I want to model that. And I tell people who might want to listen to the show, Christians who I want to have an influence in their life, I say, listen to the show. It's like you standing behind me, listening over my shoulder. You can come along with me while I do this. And this is the best way to catch the, the way that, that I, I do this kind of thing. So I, I want to mentor um, people. People uh, will consistently come up to me. I've never met them before. And they say, well, I feel like I know you. <laughs> and, and my response is, well, you do know me. You know about me, you know about my, my, my ideas, you know about my family, and about my girls, about my vacations, because these are all things that I try to integrate into my own radio environment. Now, I know some people are very um, 
in a sense, stiffly professional about their works. Just the facts, ma'am. Just give the information. And you never rattle any papers and everything's quiet. That's not my style at all. I'm relaxed. It's a conversation. I'm talking to the people through the, my, my um, engineer, you know, sometimes. And of course, they can't hear my engineer. But it creates a feel of a, a relaxed environment. If I got to rattle my papers and I, I can do that, it's not a problem for me. And, um, and I think this creates this, this, this friendly kind of atmosphere. With my kind of show, since a personal talk show, call and talk show, I can do that. It's not news broadcasting or something like that where the demands are different. Um, uh, but radio, is, by the way, is a, very, is a very personal medium. It's much more personal than TV. TV, you're on a screen, you're, you're way out there, there's a distance. In radio, though, it's happening right here. And you can listen to your radio in your home, you can listen to your radio in your bedroom, you can listen in the bathroom while you're taking a shower, while you're driving and you're all alone. It's a very intimate medium. And so it's possible to have, I think, a much greater impact if you use the medium well in people's lives and you trade on the intimacy that's available there. What I'm trying to do on radio is I'm trying to give people a piece of my mind. I want to give them a piece of my mind. I want them to see that, that the Christian way of viewing reality, the way that Jesus saw the world, is worth thinking about. We have a a little sticker that says, Stand to Reason, Christianity Worth Thinking About. And this is, frankly, a, 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 a little bit of a surprising idea to many people, especially in Europe. Because, it, especially in Europe, Christianity is not taken seriously, especially as a knowledge tradition or as a thoughtful tradition. And what I want to show people is that Christianity is worth thinking about, and I want to model that. So my background is in, Christ my training is in apologetics and philosophy. I took an MA of philosophy under J.P. Moreland over at Talbot, and the philosophy is it brings me tools that helps me to be able to work through some of these issues in a way that I think gets people's attention, the way they wouldn't necessarily with other with with uh, people with different training. So I, I don't want the show to sound like a religious show. And for this reason, there's a very important principle here that I just want to pass on, and I don't care what it is that you're doing whether you're on the technical side or you're behind a microphone or whatever it happens to be, this is very important for you to keep in mind. And American Christians don't get this. And here it is, watch your language. And I'm not talking about what that phrase usually means, like don't say cuss words. What I mean by that is you don't say religious words. In the States, it's impossible for Christians to communicate their views without including lacing their conversation thick with all kinds of religious terminology. I have tried to find synonyms for every religious word. I don't talk about Jesus. I talk about Jesus of Nazareth. I don't say I'm a Christian. Oftentimes, I'll say I'm a follower of Christ. I don't say I have faith in Jesus. I say I trust Jesus. If you say faith, people immediately think blind or leap up. The word faith has been completely corrupted in the English language for any useful purpose that we have. People misunderstand all the time, and the new atheists have really done a, a, a big job in, in corrupting it further. Okay, So I bypass that word faith. I don't talk about my faith. I talk about my convictions. All right. I don't talk about, um, uh, uh, I, I don't talk about the Bible. I talk about Jesus. What Jesus said, not what the Bible says. Jesus has credibility. The Bible doesn't have credibility. What about the rest of the New Testament? Well, those, are those are things written by the people Jesus trained to follow after him. So that's the way I characterize it. If Jesus has credibility, then the people Jesus trained, personally, they would have that credibility. What about the Old Testament? The ancient Hebrew prophets. See, it has a different ring to it. So I'm looking at the way I'm using my language. And I am trying to communicate clearly, avoiding terms that have negative religious connotations. Even the word sin, and I think that, that uh, Christians avoid the concept of sin too much, but I don't use the word that often. I use something else. I talk about man's rebellion, man's guilt. I talk about 
uh, about uh, receiving a pardon for crimes committed against the sovereign. So the concepts are there, but there are, I'm, I have worked hard to get different terminology to communicate that. So um, watching my language is really important in, in, in everything I do, whether it's my speaking or my writing. What I do not want to sound like is I do not want to sound like a radio preacher. I don't want to sound like a preacher anywhere I go, in any venue. Even if I'm preaching, I don't want to sound like a preacher. I want to sound like a reasonably intelligent human being who takes spiritual things seriously, who has thought carefully about some of this stuff, and is offering something worth thinking about to an audience. And then they can decide what they want to do with it. Give people a piece of my mind. And, and, and uh, I want to help people not just to know what to think, but how to think about it. So when I take questions, I don't take a question in three minutes, we're out, we go to the next caller. I can go 10, 15, even 20 minutes with a caller because what I want to do is I want to pace through the issue and help the caller understand how I got to my answer and how they can get to answers like this in the future. And, uh, and I think our listeners appreciate that because they, they're not going to get that kind of training in how to think from, uh, from other shows. So anyway, there's some basic things about, about w what I do on my own show. Let me make a shift here now to what, how I comport myself as a guest on somebody else's show. And I do this frequently. Uh, three or four times a month, I'm on somebody, in somebody else's program whether I'm being interviewed for something uh, on radio, and this is normally the way it is. Some other Christian station will call me and ask me about our organization. Now I'll do an hour interview about the, some book that I've written or maybe an article that I've written. And, um, and so that, that's easy going. But um, <clears throat> oftentimes I'm in a, in a, a, a hostile environment. I did a one hour DV, a TV debate with Deepak Chopra, probably the best known uh, new Age guru in the world. Um, I did a, a three-hour live radio debate with American atheist Michael Shermer, who is the uh, founder of Skeptic Magazine. I did a, a one-hour interview with Carrie Gracie on the BBC on abortion, and that was one of the hardest interviews that I had. What largest audience? There were millions of people in that audience, but I'll say something about that in, in, in just a bit. Um, I've also been on TV in Canada, Test of Faith, and, uh, and, and done things for NPR in San Francisco, a secular environment. Um, so let me give you uh, maybe seven or eight just principles. You can write them down and I'll explain them a little bit, and then we'll have some interaction Q&A. But here's some principles. These are things that I, these are my, my uh, I don't know how we put it, my battle, my rules of engagement or something like that. And you may need to make some adaptation if you're not the person in front of the camera or behind the microphone, but are assisting those who are, or are doing something similar. Because if you're in journalism, or uh, uh, I don't know how much it would apply to photography, but but keeping these same principles in mind because they do have broader application. Here's the first principle: the other guy is dangerous, or gal, as the case may be. The person on the other side of you is ideologically dangerous. Ideas have consequences. My personal conviction is the bulk of spiritual warfare is fought in the world of ideas. And there's a hint to that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Is that what 2 Corinthians? Now I can't remember the reference, but somewhere in 2 Corinthians. You know, the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are tearing down speculations and lofty things raised up against the knowledge of God. These are ideas. And so um, here's the concern. I have seen Christians go into public settings against skilled opponents thinking they have the Holy Spirit and they have the truth and that's all they need. And then they get their head handed to them on a platter in front of tens of thousands of people who are viewing. Because they did not take the other person seriously. When I say the other guy's dangerous, it doesn't mean that he's mean. He may be really nice, friendly, funny. Those are the most dangerous kind. Think of Christopher Hitchens. He was funny, one of the new atheists. He was a funny guy. 
Uh, people liked him even though he was kind of a you know, bad boy. He had a likability about him, and this really helped him in his debates against Christians. And so, so we need to take seriously the other person because I don't want to get my head handed to me on a platter in front of a bunch of people. For one, I don't want to be embarrassed in front of millions of people, just for personal reasons. Secondly, and really more importantly, I do not want embarrassment to come to the gospel because I have not done my job. This drives me to preparation. I take the other view seriously, I take the other guys seriously, and I want to be ready for them. When I was, uh, did, did this interview with Carrie Gracie, when you do a big interview, like a TV show, or in this case, this is BBC, this is huge, um, you usually have an inter a pre-interview. So you, you get a phone call, and they talk to you for an hour, an hour and a half, and, and they want to know whether you are going to be um, an adequate host, whether you can communicate well, whether your ideas are weird enough, you know, uh, and they also get a little advanced look at what you're going to present, so they, that they are able to set their side up as well. And so I had this for, I think, an hour and a half with somebody, not Carrie Gracie, she's their main talent, she's the on-air person, this is one of their staff. And so they went, pushed me through all of these things, and they were satisfied with what they heard, and they put me on the air. Now, when you're in a radio situation, you can use notes. The issue here was abortion, and I've done a lot of work and writing, not just on the issue itself, but tactical ways of communicating. How do we make our point effectively, quickly, to the point, without confusing people? Carrie Gracie, uh, you guys ever heard of Carrie? She is, a, she is their best interviewer, and she is very aggressive. And I had notes, though I, I could survive without them. I had notes there to be able to use if I needed to get a quote or something like that. I never looked at my notes because from out, just out of the gate, I realized I had to pay attention to every single second. I could not let my mind drift at all. And I don't even think I opened my eyes. I certainly didn't look at my notes because I was so focused on listening to her and being alert for her moves. And uh, I, I think I acquitted myself well but it was a tough, tough interview. And um, I mean, at the end, the issue was, what about rape and abortion? And my basic response is, I don't think it's appropriate to kill an innocent human being if, even if that child reminds you of something obviously traumatic, like a rape. As terrible as that is for a woman, Taking the life of an innocent child to help you feel better is not the right choice. And then she said, what about if the woman is gang raped? Well, this doesn't change the moral equation a bit, does it? So I gave the same answer. And she said, well, what if, what if it's a white woman gang raped by black men? What if it's African soldiers, a whole company of them, that are raping all these... So what she kept doing is asking the same question, but sounding more and more gruesome every time she asked the question. Of course, my answer was the same. But you could see what she was doing. So here's a situation where it took tremendous concentration to keep from being upended and sound foolish. And I, I think I was able to manage in that situation, but um, the other person is dangerous. You've got to keep that in mind all the time. They're dangerous. Second, um, I'm not exactly sure how to put this. I'll just say it and then explain it. The closer you can get to your opponent, the better. The closer you can get to your opponent, the better. Okay, so I had a radio debate with Michael Shermer. Um, Michael's a very well-known atheist in the States. And um, a really, he's done a lot of debates. And he's he's nice-looking man, um, like kind of like a Richard Dawkins, handsome and devil may care a little bit, and cocky, and, and funny, and, and he's actually funnier than Dawkins. Dawkins is a little bit grumpy. But, uh, and so he's got this nice affability, this friendliness that comes across, okay? Um, when I prepared for this debate, I did, I did not want to read his books, and I did not want to hear his voice, 
because my natural reaction is to want to stay as far away from this person as possible. But I had to prepare. So I listened to another radio debate that he did with another Christian. And I listened to the full three-hour debate. Okay. All right, I made it. I got through there, you know, listened to this man's voice. And then I ran it through a second time. And then a third time. And every time I listened to Michael Sherber's voice and I listened to his ideas, I got more relaxed with him. And same thing with reading his book. You know what it's like when you have these bad guys, ideologically bad guys, write these books. You think, I don't want to look in there because I'm, I'm afraid I might find something I can't answer, you know, and oh, God. So you got to read it. And invariably, I'm disappointed. Couldn't you do better than this is what I end up finding. But as I'm reading it, now I'm getting closer to him. I'm understanding his ideas. I'm getting the faith. I'll tell you what ended up happening. By the time we had the radio interview, I was so comfortable. When I walked into the studio, there was Michael Shermer. I walked up to him and I shook his hand. I said, Michael, nice to see you again. We'd met once before. He'd only vaguely recall it. I said, nice to see him. Looking forward to our time together. We ended up sitting right next to each other uh, in front of the mics. So, so the closer that I got, that is the more I, in a sense, knew him by familiarity with his voice and his ideas, the less frightening he became. And this is across the board, this is true. Your opponent, the more they stay a stranger, the more frightening they will be to you. The more you pull them close, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, you know the saying, the more you bring them close, the less frightening they appear. Okay. Third, so remember the other guy's dangerous? Get close to them if you can. And that's part of the payoff of having good preparation. You just get closer. But here's the third thing. I always start strong, or I want to start strong. The most important thing in any talk I give, any debate I'm involved with, any radio show that I'm in, even if it's a friendly environment, is the first things out of my mouth, because that's the first thing the other side, the audience, is hears. A lot of people who are interviewed, even in friendly environments, they have a book, they have an article, something that they're being interviewed for, uh, they're, they're welcomed onto the show and they say, nice to be here. Nice to be, to me that is co completely wastes the first time through. You don't have to say anything profound necessarily, but you don't say something so worn out like nice to be here. Don't, if you're a public speaker, don't ever start that way because nobody believes you. They expect people to say that because that's what everybody says, not because they really think it's really nice to be here. I always write down a sentence or two, and it doesn't have to be profound, it just has to be fresh. So if I'm, a, you know, Frank Turek is interviewing me on radio, he's got a radio show. And, I, and he says, hey, and we're friends, and so Frank will say, you know, say, hey, Greg, glad to have you back. I'll say something, Frank, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. That's not profound, but it's not nice to be here. It's just fresh. And I write it down because I do not want to stumble on my first line. Okay, so my first, my opening here, what did I do? I started out, I just read this thing from my Facebook. I immediately had everybody's attention because I was talking about something that just happened and I was reading a kind of hostile Posting, I'm like, so you guys are, what's that all about? You know, so there's an interesting a aspect to it. it. It draws you into the material. This is true whether it's a, uh, whether I'm having a, uh, uh, a debate or whether I'm doing a public presentation to a non-Christian audience um, or, uh, or doing a, a radio show or anything. You want to start strong. And there are, first impressions are really important for two reasons. For one, you want your audience, and th this is going to be true with, Photography, print media, whatever it happens to be, you want your audience to know they can trust you. You want to somehow communicate, and when I say trust, not that they believe everything you say, but what, what I mean by trust here is that, that this is a person who knows what he's doing in that circumstance. I want my listeners to feel like I'm a solid player. I belong here. I can handle myself. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to act dumb. 
And if I can get off on a good start like that, they are, okay, they take a sigh of relief a little bit mentally, say, okay, this person knows what he's doing. If you're writing print journalism or anything like that, you know how important your first line or two is. That first line pulls them into the first paragraph. That full paragraph, if, if it's successful, pulls them into the rest of the story. You gotta pull them in. It is too easy for them to take your thing and just drop it in the trash can, or if you're, they're online, just to push a button and go somewhere else. And so we need to keep that in mind. Draw them in, have, start strong. Not only does it help my listeners feel like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. He probably isn't going to fall on his face and embarrass us all. Um, it's important for me to have a good launch. If I can get out of the gates in a strong kind of way, okay, now I feel like I'm rolling. And so on that debate with my, Michael Shermer, radio, it's a little bit more give and take back and forth. I knew I, I was going to have an opportunity to start out with an introductory comment, and I, and I had that very well planned out. I also had my clothes very well planned out, so I knew I could tighten this thing down and kind of bring everything to a close. So you want to have a, a strong start. Here's the next thing. You always want to have a plan. This is particularly true when you're in hostile territory. When I say have a plan, I mean uh, the two kinds of plan. One is that kind of strategic plan. What is the big thing you want to accomplish? And I think this principle applies in print journalism and in photography too. Now, I, I have very little exposure to photography, but I know that photographers are trying to say something with their medium. Well, what are you trying to say? What, what do you want your audience to take away at the end of the talk? They're not going to remember much. So what is the kind of big idea? This is my strategy. Um, having a plan calms my nerves a little bit, helps me to stay on track, and it keeps the audience from getting, getting lost. In, in the Shermer debate, for example, my, here's what I wanted to accomplish. I, I wanted to demonstrate that Christianity was reasonable, it was rational, it was credible. I wasn't trying to disprove atheism and to prove Christianity. Okay? That's too big of a task. I'm just trying to show you we've got something going here. It's worth thinking about. And that, I think, has more power even in Europe because, like I said, the ideas that people have about Christianity are so bad. If some Christian person pops his or her head up and offers something reasonable, they're going to say, wow, I never even thought that you could think like this. I also have, in addition to, uh, in the case of uh, um, Deepak Chopra, my goal with Deepak Chopra, since he's such a popular figure, was not to pit Greg Kokel against Deepak Chopra, because Chopra's famous, nobody knows Kokel, me, okay? It was to pit Deepak Chopra against Jesus of Nazareth. So I would say, well, Dr. Chopra says, and I always said Doc, Dr. Chopra, I never called him Deepak. Now, I might have, and it wouldn't have been rude because he's known as Deepak, but now I'm playing to his brand. Deepak, you know, he was always Dr. Chopra to me, okay? A Dr. Chopra says this, but Jesus says this. Who are you going to believe? You want to believe Dr. Chopra? You want to believe Jesus? Jesus still has more credibility than Deepak Chopra. So that was the strategy in general. But I also had a tactical plan. That is, some of these people I know are going to hit on particular little things. I know they're going to come up because I've heard them say it before in other situations. So I have to think about how can I respond to these individual points that are being made in a quick fashion. And um, I'm thinking of Michael Shermer here because I know that Michael Shermer consistently would ask the question, well, who created God? Now, this is, and, and, uh, Richard Dawkins does, and all, all these new atheists do this. Now, this is, a, this is, this is, this, and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it and be charitable here, but um, um, this is completely unfair for these, for these people to raise this question. Because to a person, all of these people know that, that there is nothing about the Christian's view that requires that he answer that question. All right? Because we believe God is eternal. He is self-existent. Therefore, he doesn't have a beginning. Now, Richard Dawkins said, even a child knows to ask this question, who created God? I, and my response is, that's because they're children. Professor Dawkins, you shouldn't be asking a question that a, 
that a, a child doesn't know any better than to ask. You ought to know better. So how do I deal with this in a way? Now I could have, I could have just said what I said to Michael Shermer. That would have been an adequate answer. But I wanted to think of something that was just a little bit more um, poignant. So I said, Mike. When, so he raised the question. I was ready for it. He said, uh, "So who created God?" There you go. I said, "Listen, Michael, um, um, you don't you don't believe God was created because you don't believe in God. I don't believe God was created because I think He was eternal. Nobody in this conversation believes that God was created. So why are you asking me who created God?" <laughs> okay. Now notice that I offered a I, I did it in the form of a question. Ultimately, that drops the ball back into the, his court. This is part of the tactical approach, and this is in the book on tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. Did I mention I wrote a book on this? I hope you get a look at it, because I think it will help you. But uh, there I used uh, my tactical. There's just an example of preparing in advance for one thing I was pretty sure was going to come up, and I was right there. Most people are not quick on their feet. I'm not quick on my feet. You can sound like you're quick on your feet, though, if you prepare in advance for specifics. So always have a plan, have a strategic plan. What's the big impact I want to make here? And this helps keep you on course. And, uh, and if necessary, then have a, strategic, a tactical plan as well. Incidentally, I wrote a whole article dealing with, uh, explaining how I prepared for the, de for the Shermer debate. And it's on our website. And it's called Prepping for Engagement. Prepping for Engagement. If you go to str.org. Um, and just type in prepping for engagement. You'll find it and you're free to read it, download it, print it out, whatever, and all the details are there. It's always better in whatever you're re writing or speaking to be specific rather than general. To be specific rather than general. When I talk about the abortion issue and I make reference, I, I, at one point I make reference to what happened at 9 11 in the states, and I said on uh, on September uh, September 11, 2001, 2,977 people lost their lives in American soil. Now it's a very specific number, but more than that, lose their lives every single day, day after day, month after month for 40 some years here through abortion. So I take a, I. I I, I'm making reference to the carnage of abortion, but I try to make it real by giving something they can tie into. To th Everybody was shaken by that, obviously, but that's what has a daily occurrence when it comes to abortion. Um, I was in um, a, 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 a radio forum with Gary Wills. Gary Wills is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, historian from Northwestern University. Uh, I mean, I was really honored to be on the same platform with him. And when he uh, and our discussion was about religion in America, and the very first question went to Dr. Wills, and the question was, it says, "We the people, 250 years ago, who were the people? What were they like religiously? The the founders." And he said, "Well, the founders, common misconception, but the founders uh, were deists. They were not Christians." And then blah blah blah. This is a common thing for people to say. The problem is. In this case, it was the Pulitzer Prize winning historian that was making this statement. Now, he was wrong. But how am I, little Mr. Nobody, standing next to Professor Wills, are going to demonstrate this? Well, I had some facts. So when the mic was passed to me, I said, well, the Founding Fathers is a proper noun. It's the 55 men who signed the, 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 uh, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitutional Convention. We know who these 55 men were, and we all know their, we know their religious affiliation. And back then, they actually had to swear allegiance to a doctrinal statement to be a member of a church. We know how many Baptists, how many Reformed, Dutch Reformed, we know how many Anglicans, we, all, all, and, I, and I, just from memory, I had a couple of these details. They said, it turns out 51 of the 55 signers were publicly sworn, what we would consider now to be fundamentalist Christians. The four others included 
um, Franklin, who was a deist of sorts, but not like the Continental deists. He was a unique kind of deist because he was the one who led the prayer at the Constitutional Convention to break the tie. So even they were not that rigid of deists, but I laid this out. Essentially, I'm telling the audience, and this is on NPR now, also it's being broadcast, the Pulitzer Prize winning historian is making a mistake. I finished my comments, I didn't attack him, I just gave, but I gave the details. And I pushed the mic away and I sat there and I'm waiting now for Dr. Wills to grab the mic and go after me. And he, he sat there, didn't do anything, and after a pause, the moderator moves to the next question. See, I had the goods and my response was more persuasive than his because even though he had the credentials, I had the facts and I used the particulars in my presentation so it made it more persuasive. In the, uh, the tactic, uh, Just the Facts, Ma'am, in the book on tactics, I talk about that uh, a bit. Let me, uh, let me offer one more thought. In a situation when you're in, in a, dealing with a hostile, ideologically hostile person, you always want to try to win the listener, not that person. I never try to win my debate, the debate opponent. Um, I never try to win the person who, Kerry Gracie. Um, I'm not trying to win Michael Shermer. Once you get in print on something, you know, you're pretty much not going to change your mind usually hard to psychologically. I want to influence the people that are listening. And so even though there's a sense in which I'm addressing the other person, I am always thinking about how my words are sounding to the listener, the person that may be on the fence a little bit out there. And I, I, I want my manners to be pristine. I don't want to be nasty, mean, anything like that. I owe it to the Lord to, to have good manners but it's also persuasive. When you are kind to the other person, when you are gracious to them, when you agree with them when you're capable of agreeing because they've made a good point, you acknowledge that. That sounds even-handed, fair-minded, uh, and it makes you look stronger rather than weaker. Well, I actually talked longer than I anticipated, and I apologize for doing that. But again, I hope that some of those points are things that you will be able to integrate in some fashion into your own work, keeping in mind the other guy's dangerous, uh, respect the opposition, take it seriously, have a plan, start strong, watch your language, trust God, and then let, let the chips fall.